Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2. Today, John Coleman and I are joined with a virtual gourmet, John Mariani. How are you doing, John and John? I am very well. Thank you. John, good to see you again. Hey, John, uh, not too long ago, we talked about um, uh, uh, the Bond books and the fact that uh, Ian Fleming was a, a great um, writer of food and drink, and Bond, of course, was a, a gourmand. And um, Are there other of your favorite writers like Ian Fleming that... that um, were notable in terms of their descriptions of food and drink? Uh, curiously enough, a lot of crime writers, Nero Wolf, Rex Stout, uh, Leslie Charteris, um, uh, a lot of the, the figures and the, uh, the Falcon and, uh, and uh, with the Perry Mason, they were all gourmands. And uh, Robert Parker's uh, crime books are filled with, uh, with food and cooking and so forth. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Some of them get to travel to exotic places like Hercule Poirot, who goes, you know, to mm. death on the, well, on the Orient Express. Um, <clears throat> so they fancy themselves that way. But um, uh, Bond was one of the first of a really masculine, manly man type. Guys like Nero Wolfe and Perry Mason, they were stout. Yes. And they were uh, slightly effeminate in, in some ways. And... Uh, Guys, you, if you were across the table from them, you would be intimidated by their um, demeanor. Whereas if you were across, the, across from Bond, uh, he's, he's a pretty impressive figure. You know, you wanted to be across, especially if you were a woman. So what other, what other writers uh, would you put in that, in that category with Bond uh, regarding food, drink? And the, the, greatest of, the greatest of them all was Ernest Hemingway. Really? Um, barely a page in Hemingway in which somebody is at the very least not drinking and very often eating. And, um, and you have to remember that Hemingway did travel the world, unlike any other writer who's ever existed. He was in Hong Kong when the Japanese were, were there at war. He was in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. He liberated the Ritz. Uh, hotel in Paris with the Eighth Army when uh, the Americans, the Allies, came back into Paris. And of course, he's he's very well known for a movable feast, which is his days in Paris when he was quote very poor and very happy when he ate at the bistros and ate the oysters with the glistening oysters with a bottle of uh, Chablis. And then in both Florida and Cuba, um, he had written for Esquire magazine thirty three straight. Uh, travel essays for the Esquire for its first issue, 33 straight uh, months, uh, about uh, fishing for marlin and, and the big fish and how to cook them and the nights at Harry's Bar in Venice uh, and the nights at um, uh, La Floradita with the uh, grapefruit daiquiris. I mean, his, his, his prose is just replete with it and nobody writes better about food and wine than he did. So much so that people, let's say he, he wrote about a place, one of his favorite places was uh, Leap, which is a L-I-P-P, which is a brasserie in Montparnasse in, in Paris. And he has this wonderful passage about how, when I had money, you know, I would go there and just order six Marin oysters and love to see how they brought the chilled um, a, a bucket that held a Chablis, which is a cheap wine. Um, it was the bistro wine of, of the day. It was not a or anything like that. And uh, he talks about that. And then he, he talks about how they served of a servalas, which is a sausage. Well, I guarantee you, uh, Leap is open to this day and it's open probably right now. And if we went there, the three of us musketeers, um, you would look around you and they're probably on 40, 50% of the tables are going to be that exact meal that Hemingway ordered because of that. He made botin. B O T I N in Madrid, famous saying it's the greatest restaurant in the world. It's also the oldest restaurant in the world, and he says the greatest restaurant in the world. And there you drink the you you eat the suckling pig, and you drink the dark wines of Rioja. And um, uh, throughout all of his, his when he was in Italy, uh, when he was uh, during the World War One, he was an ambulance driver. He talks about the wines he learned about there. So every place he went. 
he learned about the food and wine of the region and the culture. But also back in America, I mean, he was a, considered one of the greatest fishermen, big sea and otherwise, in America. And his fondest memories are growing up up in Michigan, which is the title of one of his, uh, his uh, tales, and the fishing the rivers up there and the rainbow trout and the bass. And one of his greatest short stories, which is called A Big Two-Hearted River, just a beautiful naturalistic uh, uh, nature story. Um, uh, he talks about putting the bacon in the pan and getting it to the right sizzle and then putting the trout, which has this slippery color, which turns a different color and sitting there and then eating it with some potatoes he had or some canned beans and just being very, very happy and content. I mean, he had this ability to convey without ever coming off as the tutti frutti um, gourmet type um, that uh, even you find with Bond with his uh, shaken, not stirred martinis and his his insistence that things be the exact temperature, sake be 98.4 degrees, et cetera. Um, uh, Hemingway was never like that. He had gusto. He had great taste and he had gusto. And he learned about these things on the streets of Paris and Madrid, and uh, just as he learned the languages in those places. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I'll have to go back and, and reread some uh, Hemingway because, of course, I remember him as the sportsman, Papa Hemingway, the fisherman um, and uh, an adventurer. Uh, but uh, for some reason, the, the food descriptions uh, that you're recounting don't don't I don't recall them. But I have yeah, to go also, back and find them because I, I, I love this writing. I have to, I have to remark that uh, uh, and, very few people other than a gourmet, our gourmet, uh, John Mariani, would, uh, uh, talking randomly about uh, authors and, and food and things, would come up with Hemingway. Because I would bet that 98% or more of anybody, when you say to them, did you know that uh, Hemingway was a gourmet uh, and had this wonderful, wide, broad taste of food, would say, what, he, he, he went beyond the liquor menu? Uh, and the wine menu, so uh, it's, 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 it's kind of fun that um, because you're so good at this stuff and you really notice this stuff, that you would be able to talk eloquently about it for probably now four or five minutes about his food choices, where I don't think most people would ever assume that Hemingway and food, fine food, were really related. Ask, ask the same question this way person who has read Hemingway, as we all did, and many people read, read especially a movable feast, uh, but okay, I'm going to Paris. Okay? You know where I want to eat? I want to eat with all those places that, that Hemingway mentioned, because they're also very, very famous. Choiseul le Lilas up in Montparnasse, Le Rotonde up in Montparnasse, Lip, as I just mentioned in Montparnasse, and oh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, Cuba. Is La Fara, a lot of detail still uh, open? Because that's what we used to drink every night with Spencer Tracy and and uh, and, and all these famous people. And uh, in Venice, you know, oh, you got to go to Harry's Bar and have the Bellini. You know, you got to go to Harry's Bar and eat the. I mean, I, I think that most people who have even slight familiarity. With Hemingway, oh, Botine too. Do you know? Do you know? As a matter of fact, in Botine, uh, rather in Madrid, because he ate all over the place. His favorite place to hang out with the bullfight was a place called Cerveceria Alamana, and uh, you go in there and there's photographs of himself. But <clears throat> there's actually a restaurant that has a plaque outside saying Hemingway did not eat here. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much people follow his advice <laughs> to this day. Wow. Well, a little bit of literary reference, a little bit of food and wine. I think this has been a wonderful experience. Thank you, John. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.